My name is Craig Polson. I work at Fire Station HC Platoon. Today we're honoring the 23rd anniversary of Captain Joe Dupee, who selflessly gave his life in the line of duty at 5972 Southwestern. I hope to share with you today is kind of the story of this incident, how it came about, some of the things that happened during this incident, but more importantly, what I really want to drive home is, is the lessons learned. And responding to structure fires, and even that day was, was, was a routine shift. We showed up, we had lineup, Engine 57's busy. We ran a, a bunch of calls, up and including until the time we got that structure fire at 2.20 in the morning. When we get on scene of a structure fire, the enemy isn't the size of the building. It isn't the velocity of the smoke. It isn't the amount of fire that's showing. It's us. Because as I look back at that fire, we lost a firefighter and in all reality should have buried all of Engine 57. But we lost a firefighter for for dog bones and and and, and pig ears. And that building was was a a commercial occupancy as a one story, let's call it 70 by 120. We got on scene of that fire and Task Force 66 had given a size up that said we have a one story commercial with light smoke showing. Engine 57 was coming out of the south, headed north, and we got on scene and we were giving back a fire attack. So Cap told me to pull off a line. I pulled an inch and a half to the front door. 66 has had an inch and three quarter. 46 is shortly there, uh, got on scene shortly thereafter we did. As I describe the conditions on scene and as I, got, as I take you guys through the fire and I kind of lay out what we did, I, I, time, for time constraints, I don't have a lot of time to spend on that fire because I want to put that time and energy into the lessons learned. But I want you to think about, because one of the things that we have at our disposal are NIOSH reports. Every time there's a line of duty death or a near miss, NIOSH comes out with a report. And I think those, those, at least in the military, the military, anytime there's a near miss or a line of duty death, that's mandatory reading. So I would encourage you to study NIOSH reports. They don't have to be LAFD NIOSH reports. You can pick up a NIOSH report off of any department in the country. There's plenty of them, unfortunately, to choose from. But the lessons that are gleaned and learned from those NIOSH reports are, are invaluable. That is our our crafts, our industry's Bible, NIOSH reports. So I would encourage you to incorporate that into your 957s on a monthly basis with your, your, your crews and your companies. What the NIOSH report actually does is it breaks down an incident from the time of dispatch to the conclusion of the incident. In this particular structure fire, it was, it was a failure on many levels, but the ultimate failure is it resulted in a line of duty death. And I'm here to tell you that you don't have to walk this road to, to learn those lessons. That road's already been walked, and it's my goal out of my heart that you guys can kind of listen to what I have to say, kind of take the overview of this fire, and, and moving forward, train your companies, um, talk with your people, refine your SOGs, refine your SOPs, so that we can kind of stop the pattern of line of duty deaths. Will we ever reach that point? I don't know. But it's my goal that, that the lessons that are learned from this incident are, are remembered because really we honor Joe with an incredible, incredible funeral, as, as incredible as a funeral can possibly be. The legacy that, that he should have and that needs to, to stay alive and be maintained is through the lessons learned and and what we're doing as, a, as an organization. Los Angeles City Fire Department has done a ton of things in the last 23 years to keep its members safe. And with Chief Poyer's culture of safety, this falls light, right in line with what the message from the administration is. So let's go back to the incident. The incident was a one-story commercial, light smoke showing. Task Force 66 gave that size up. Engine 57, which I was on, I was Joe's Nozelman that day was backing up 66s, 46s got on scene and 33s got on scene. So we're kind of, you got four companies going into one portal of entry. It took almost nine and a half minutes to get that front door open. And that nine and a half minutes is a critical period of time. Truck 33 and truck 66 were on the roof doing vertical ventilation and the conditions on the roof were, were, were untenable. 
every time they dip their saw in, they're drawing orange. Unbeknownst to them, there isn't a fire attack company inside yet. We're still dealing with forcible entry. The door finally gets opened. We start to make our, our advance down a hallway. The way the building was laid out, you opened up the front door, you walked down a hallway, and then the hallway terminated into what opened up into a warehouse. One thing that I realized now that I did not know back then is when that front door got open, typically you'd expect a lot of smoke to be coming out. There was no smoke coming out. It was getting sucked in as fast as, it, as, fast as that building would allow it to. 23 years fast forward, looking back, I, I kind of understand what that means now. That was an oxygen starved fire, deep seated fire. We opened that door accompanied with vertical ventilation with no hose lines applying water. That was a fire that was, that fire triangle was being completed. When we opened up that door, crawling down that hallway, I personally had a feeling of something isn't right. And I didn't understand what that was. They call it spider instincts. So if something's telling you that something's not right, you have to listen to that, that intuition because it never lies to you. As we were crawling down that hallway, there was little visibility. The smoke, the smoke level was, was, was down just off the floor. So the line of, me, line of demarcation was, was fairly low. Once we got to the end of that hallway where it terminated and opened up into that warehouse, there was zero visibility, zero visibility. So I want you to imagine that the truck's been on the roof for at least eight minutes ahead of the engine company. There's no water being flown. We have zero visibility. The heat level at that point was probably chest high. We were on our stomachs and we were crawling through a building that we've never been in before under conditions with zero visibility and, and fairly high heat. I don't know what the time frame was, but we got to remember back then we had the Mark II survive air breathing apparatus. So your working time at a structure fire, if you were in phenomenal shape, was probably 15 minutes on a 30 minute bottle. So I, I don't know how long we were in there, but I remember advancing our, our hose line to a place where we couldn't go any farther. And I remember the heat level was starting to, to drop down lower and lower from the time we got into that warehouse. And this is over the course of maybe, maybe two to three minutes. There was a lot of 55 gallon drums, 25 gallon drums. So, the, so advancing that hose line through the front door into where that, that office area terminates into that warehouse. And then once we got into the warehouse, we started to, to navigate and advance our hose line. We got to a certain point where I felt like we weren't making any progress and it was starting to get hotter and hotter and hotter. What I want you to remember as we travel through this incident is that what's happening at ground level may not necessarily be what's happening 25 feet above your head. So if you were to tell me 23 years ago, if I was to, to, to open up that hose line in that atmosphere to try to cool that atmosphere down, I probably would have gotten the boot in the back of my head. We never did those things. And as we travel through this, this incident, when I get into the lessons learned piece of that, it's gonna make a lot more sense why cooling down that atmosphere may have bought us some more time, if that would have been a coordinated effort. We got to a certain extent or a certain point in that building where, where I felt like we couldn't go any farther. The heat was starting to, to get uncomfortable and that's in a short amount of time from the time we entered that building. So what's happening in that building is the fire dynamics are changing rapidly. I think that's because there's vertical ventilation that opened up that flow path. And once that front door got open, it introduced that oxygen. That's all that fire was needing, is that last little bit of oxygen. Without water being flowed, without, without water being applied into that atmosphere, we're, we're creating, we're not lessening the flashover potential. There was never a point where there was enough water flowed in that building to take that, that temperature curve and drop it down to make it a manageable piece. We got to a point where I know what it is now, but back then I didn't understand what it was. I saw what I, what I, what I thought was flame. So I opened up my nozzle and I hit it and it, and it kind of dissipated. But when I saw that flame, it illuminated what I thought was, was a four by four. So I took my nozzle over and I, and I kind of ran it up like a pike pole and I hit something solid. And I went over about another five feet and I did it again. 
and I realized what we were under, we were under a mezzanine. So I, I, I told Captain Dupuy, I said, hey, we're in a really bad spot. We can't find the sea this fire. We're under a mezzanine. We need to kind of back out and regroup. He said, Roger, let's go. But one thing I, I want to share with you is that what I saw when I saw that flame, what that was, was that was the spidering. That, were the, well, that was a late stage sign of flashover. When you start to see that, that was telling you right there that if those conditions don't change in that atmosphere, because quite honestly, the vertical ventilation that was taking place was amazing. But in order to ventilate that, that fire properly, you would have needed to take at least three quarters of that roof off. The amount of fire, the amount of the, the volume of smoke and the conditions that were on the inside, there, it was, there wasn't enough ventilation to, to accompany what was happening on the inside. And that wasn't being communicated. In the process of us retreating from, from the interior, starting to make our way out, my low air warning bell went off. And the process going in, the, the, the order was myself as a nozzle member, Ted Nelson was the hydrant member, and Captain Dupuy was the engine captain. So that was the order of going into that fire. As we retreated, I turned around, I had the nozzle with me, so it was myself, it was Ted, and Joe behind us. My low air warning bell went off, and I don't remember how long we were in there. It could have been three, four minutes. But from the time we got in through the front door until the time we decided to, to retreat was probably a total of maybe five or six minutes. And remember, with those Mark II Survivor, you had maybe 15 minutes of working time under conditions that were would be way less than what we were encountering with the heat and the smoke. As we started to retreat out of that fire, it started to get hotter and hotter and hotter. And the one thing that I couldn't understand is where I thought the closer we were getting to the front door, the hotter it was getting. Well, what was happening was the fire was starting to burn everything on top of the mezzanine, so the heat was starting to get driven down. The, the atmosphere is starting to become one of, that's gonna become a flashover if something doesn't change, and there wasn't a lot of water being applied into that atmosphere, if any at all, other than the, the short blast that I gave when I saw that, which was that spidering and that fingering. As we got closer to the door, the hotter it got, so that, that was kind of playing on our minds. It didn't make any sense to me. And I had the nozzle in my hand, I chose to bring the nozzle. So I knew that we were going the right way. I just couldn't, I couldn't connect the dots of why it was getting hotter. It got to the point where I was getting low on air. So in my mind, I had already pre-planned this through, through training and, and sucking my face piece to my face. At that time, we had a second stage regulator hose that came off that hooked into your, your bypass that was, that was on your hip. So I had practiced numerous times of what happens if I run out of air, because we had two options back then. You had a brother, buddy breathing connection that was on the face piece, so you could buddy breathe with, your, with another member, and or you disconnect, disconnect that face piece hose and you put it inside your face piece pouch. And I had practiced that numerous times. I got to the point where as we were retreating, this whole time I never knew that Joe was not behind us. I, I knew that Ted was there, because he was helping pull hose, I, I, I made an assumption that Joe was behind Ted. We didn't have any more communication once we decided to retreat and kind of back out and regroup and get our bearings. That was the last conversation I ever had with Joe. So in the process of us making that determination that we're gonna leave to the time we get back to what we thought was the front door and, and get back to that hallway into a safe area, there was no communications. And it was a short amount of time from the time we retreated to the time where I felt like I was going to suck my face piece to my face. So I had a decision to make. My decision process was, do I, do I buddy breathe with Ted Nelson's bell that's going off? And now we have another problem because if I buddy breathe and I hook into his face piece and he runs out of air, now we're, we're both gonna be in trouble. So I made, the conscious, constant, I made a conscious decision to, if I get to that point, if we don't get out into that, into that office area, without getting off air. If I can't make it there, I'm gonna disconnect my face piece hose and I'm gonna put it in my coat. And it was shortly thereafter that I did run out of air. I took my last breath, I disconnected my face piece hose, I put it in my coat, I zipped up that pouch and told Ted, I'm out of air, we need to get to that, to that door. How far were we in that building? I would say maybe 35, 40 feet. 
from the time I disconnected my, my face piece hose and put it in my pouch. It did seem like an eternity, and I will tell you that that there, there's a difference between panicking and being scared. Was I scared? Yes, I was scared. In fact, I was scared to death. And it's kind of, it's kind of weird what kind of goes through your mind. At the time, my son was five years old, been married for about seven years, and I was kind of angry. I was kind of angry that I'm in this position. I, I started to see my wife, I started to see my son, but I got angry. And I said, I'm not gonna die here today. If I die, it's not gonna be without a fight. And I wanna tell you that training is everything. Because you can't replicate that, that scenario, but I've carried that cross for you, so you don't have to, to go through this. I've been carrying it for 23 years. And, and I wanna share with you that, that we, we don't have to put ourselves in these positions. And, and that anger turned into maybe motivation to try to fight and, and, and to, to, to fight to fight to find that way to that hallway. I just wanted to get back to that office area hallway. It was only for for sure the grace of God that that Ted and I didn't die in that fire as well as, as Captain Dupee. But there was a light that our engineer Dan Martins had placed at the doorway between the end of the hallway that terminates into the warehouse. And we had zero visibility. We had heavy heat to the ground. We, at that point, when I disconnected my face piece hose, we were on our stomachs and it was hot. I felt like I was burning up. I felt, in fact, I felt like I was burning alive. And I look over to the right and I saw that hand lantern that was on the ground. And I told Ted, that's the way to go. And, and he said, Are you sure? yes, that's the way to go. And Heavy smoke, heavy heat to the ground, and that light was visible. Just for a short amount of time, just to, to get us from point A to point B. And it was odd because I didn't realize, but when the mezzanine was burning, everything on top of that mezzanine, because when you walked at the end of that hallway, when you got out into that warehouse, there was a mezzanine that kind of went like that through probably about half of that building. So it makes sense today, 23 years later, but it did not make any sense because the closer we were getting to our entrance, which would turn out to be our exit, it was getting hotter and hotter and hotter. So if you're ever questioning yourself and you know that you're doing the right thing, you have the nozzle, you're following the hose line, little to big, back to the rig, you're, you're doing all those things and you're following that hose line, don't question yourself. There's gotta be something else that's driving. Um, take, take solace in, in, your, in your experience and your knowledge and trust, trust what you've trained on and trust what you, what you have practiced. We get back to, we, we make it over to that hallway that was the transition from the warehouse back into the, into the office area. And I see my engineer, Dan Martins, Ted Nelson, the hydrant member, myself. And I asked Dan Martins, I said, when did Joe come out? He said, he hasn't come out. I said, what do you mean he hasn't come out? He hasn't come out yet. I remember laying in that hallway, and at the time, we didn't have Mayday. We didn't have emergency traffic. We had Red Alert. I remember seeing another member down the hallway, and I said, Red Alert, Red Alert. Captain Dupee has not come out of the fire. And I, I think at that moment, don't know that kind of time kind of stood still because you realize this isn't a drill. This is real. This is, this is real life. And one of our own is down missing or trapped. And I remember crawling down that hallway, going out back out to the sidewalk. And I remember taking my SCBA off my back, taking my, my bottle out, getting another bottle from the engineer from, from engine 66, putting my bottle back into my SCBA, putting that bottle back on my shoulders and reaching back to turn it on, and I couldn't turn it on, I didn't have the strength. So I took my bottle, my SCBA, back off my back, put it in front of me, turned it on, put it back on, went back down that hallway to where it terminates into the warehouse, and I remember seeing 
floor to ceiling fire. That, that whole environment flashed. And I remember, I remember just a helpless feeling like my captain's in there and there's nothing I can do. The heat eventually drove us back down that hallway out to the sidewalk. And I remember the three of us being taken to truck 29. And they kind of escorted us away from the incident and kind of just put us off to the side as the firefighting efforts uh, continued. And I remember on TAC-12 hearing, we found Captain Dupee and we're, we're pulling him out. It, it kind of felt like your life had just been, the life that you had, you were kind of whole, whole as a person. That wholeness, it just kind of got ripped out of you. And you just, I just remember feeling empty inside. I remember feeling helpless. I remember feeling uh, just the worst feeling I've ever felt in my life. And there's nothing you could do to change the outcome. And that's kind of a snapshot of the actual conditions of that fire for the balance of the time that we're gonna to share together today. I, I kind of just wanna walk you through the lessons learned. What our organization has done in the last 23 years to, to, to make us better firefighters and to give us more tools and, and uh, more things to, to have successful outcomes when we go to structure fires and starting off with the the risk assessment process and not only about the the modes versus offensive defensive or investigative but taking it a step further are we in the rescue profile are we in the exposure profile or are we in the property profile and actually kind of taking those to heart i understand um in, in some fires that the initial offensive or defensive component may not be necessarily um, obvious, but just remember something. Every fire paints you a picture, and it's kind of up to us to read it. Some are kind of easy, some are kind of difficult. So if you're not sure, then don't declare mode. Tell Metro, hey, I, I, I'm kind of unsure at this point. We're leaning towards this, but I'll get you back. I'll get back with you on, on a, when I get as soon as I get a better size up or a more complete picture of what we actually have. The 360 component that that's being developed on actual trying to bring um, continuity on on what a 360 looks like uh, is is a huge component of some of the things that we've learned in the last 23 years. We have Mayday and Grab Lives. Back then we had Red Alert, and after that fire, that we transitioned from from Red Alert to emergency traffic, and then in 2014. As an organization, we, we came into Mayday. The Mayday and Grab Lives component's huge because we were in self-rescue. We didn't have an REC team coming to get us. When, when, when I ran out of air and went into my face piece pouch and Ted was low on air, we didn't have an REC company coming to get us. We were doing self-survival. So basically, we were doing Grab Lives without having Grab Lives. We had our flashlights on, but we didn't make the call. Nobody ever knew we were in trouble. We were just kind of managing it amongst ourselves. That, that red alert never went out. So there wasn't companies on scene that, that had any idea that we were having problems. So if you ever get into a situation, don't be afraid to call that Mayday and call it early. And call it early. That Grab Lives component, I know we kind of, we kind of him and haw over actually memorizing the, the Grab Lives, but if you break down grab lives, the actual mnemonic itself, you're doing the mnemonic itself, you're actually doing most of it anyway. There's only a couple of things you're gonna have to do. You're gonna have to activate your pass device because your pass device probably isn't going off. So you want that at full automatic mode. You wanna get that activated. You're gonna have to make the call. You're gonna have to go mayday, 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 kind of who, what, where, lay out your description, kind of paint that picture to the IC so he or she can start to implement a plan to come help you. The balance of the mnemonic of Grab Lives, you're already doing it. You've got your, your lights on, you've activated your pass device, you're kind of looking for a way out of there, hopefully. You've kind of grabbed yourself, you kind of composed yourself, 
And I want to go back and hit on something I, I think I'd mentioned earlier about being scared versus panicky. You're going to be scared. Uh, you know, when you get into a scenario like that, that's where all the training for all the years that you've done, the relentless drills over and over that kind of seem mundane, and we have to do this again and again and again. But yeah, all that kind of comes to the front and it all kind of comes in at one time. And that's where you're able to navigate out of a scenario where uh, it's kind of bad. It's really bad. It may even be life threatening. But the difference between you panicking and kind of keeping your composure, and it's okay to be scared. But once you panic, you lose your dexterity. Your, your thought process starts to drop. You're, you're, you start to get into like a high speed wobble and you start to spin out. Then you lose that training, that, that ability to recall that information at that critical moment that you need. And, and the way to eliminate that panic is to be comfortable in your SOGs and to constantly train on that. If you have to call a mayday and you've practiced it over and over, you just haven't filled in the blanks, it's going to happen. It's going to just come. That process, yeah, you're gonna be nervous, but you'll be able to get out that information that's critical to the incident commander to kind of put people in place to, to kind of help you and navigate, hopefully coming to get you. We may not always have an RAC team at the ready. So that self-survival piece going back to grab lives is huge. One of the greatest advancements that we've had in the last 23 years is the smoke recognition program. That single component gives our organization, Los Angeles City Fire Department, the ability to, to recreate and create conditions that are real, that are heavy smoke, that are heavy heat, and, and put companies in a controlled environment, but yet realistic scenario to practice advancing hose, uh, practice what it's like to, to feel real heat, real life scenarios and work as a, as a company and put multiple companies in um, an environment to where you're replicating a structure fire. And if you were to take this Western fire and break it down as a NIOSH report, from the time the first company got on scene till the time that that fire eventually went out with the, with the passing of Captain Joe Dupee, you'll start to see all the signs and all, all the things that if that fire would have got corrected here or there may have made a huge difference in the outcome of that fire. Every NIOSH report says the same thing, most of them. Can't speak to all of them, but a good majority of them paint the same picture. As you read them, you can start taking notes and you can start realizing, hey, this is a red flag, this is a red flag. You look at the wildland environment, you got the tens and the eights. We have that for the structure environment. It's up to us to employ that. It's up to us to kind of break these down. What, what is that? What kind of building do we have? What's that smoke telling us? Smoke will tell you everything. It's up to you. You got to read it. What's the velocity? What's the turbulence? What's the density? What's the color? What kind of building are we in? How much fire do we have showing or do we have any fire showing at all? Is this building presenting like it's once it gets that oxygen introduced either via a front door, a rear door or vertical ventilation, is this building going to flash? Is this building good? Is that smoke ignitable at that point? Remember, we get the 911 call that the, the, the t by the time we get on scene, we're right in that transition. And UL has shown us in the last 23 years, the flow paths and the science behind what things are, how, how things are different now than they were 25, 30, 40 years ago. Construction features, materials being used. So flashover is going to happen at an accelerated rate where it didn't happen 25, 30 years ago at this rate that it's happening now. Kind of as we end our time today, I, I, I want to kind of capture who, who Joe was as a person, at least from my perspective and, and the short time that I had a chance to to be with him and spend time with him. He was an amazing father, amazing husband, a great fire officer, a great firefighter. Um, he had 17 years on when he passed away. And I would just ask you, are you prepared at home with your families? Have you, most of us don't go to work thinking about a line of duty death unless you've kind of actually walked through this. But are you, is everything right at home? And because as much as you want to just shake this 
And I think I'd mentioned the word whole and emptied earlier, the words, it, this is as much part of me as my, my hands are at, at my legs and I can't ever shake it. Not that I, you know, 23 years later, not that I would, would, would ever want to. Cause it's kind of like, I think part of our, part of our demise sometimes is our, our pride and our arrogance. Sometimes it clouds our judgment. And I'm here to tell you that we are the best part of part of the world. There's no doubt about that. By far, we are the best part of part of the world. But there's there's an element of humility that that we we have to have. And I know through this incident, I've gotten a dose of it. And, and I, I try to operate like that. I try to be humble. I try not, and there's a difference between having pride in your apparatus, and I'm not talking about that kind of pride, I'm talking about pride and arrogance, because it clouds your judgment. You don't make good decisions when you're arrogant. Yeah, you kind of want these companies that are a little cocky, because they're, they're, they're good at what they do, but there's also got to be that element of humility. And I will tell you that when you're cleaning out a locker, and you have family members of that loved one that's passed away, that are coming to get the, the belongings, there, there's no words to describe what that looks like. And you now have a widow with two kids, just like that. It happened just like that. When we're on duty day to day and everything that we do, you have to carve out time to train on structure fires. And you have to make the time to make sure that your people are prepared, that they have and made a process in place, that they understand grab lives, that they understand the risk assessment policy, that they understand what a 360, because I would, I would submit to you that some of the greatest leaders on this job aren't wearing white and orange helmets, they're wearing the yellow ones. Utilize, pick their brains. There's a lot of experience on this job. And I will tell you that I'm reminded by one of our uh, our leadership academy instructors. His name is Colonel Darren Erickson. He's uh, he runs MCRD down at Camp Pendleton. He oversees the the recruits, and he tells me all the time. He goes, "Craig, the Marine Corps is in great hands. We have great people that are coming into the Marine Corps, and and I feel the same way about the the people that are coming on our job. We have great people coming on our job." It's up to us to train them and give them that, that experience and share that knowledge and pass it down. This fire, looking forward 23 years ago, from 23 years ago to now, did not have to happen. It did not have to have this, this outcome. And, and, and that's, that's the cross that I carry, because you can't shake, you, that just never leaves you. That burden is always on you. You learn to just kind of manage it. And uh, it's my hope that maybe this resonates, this, this brief time that we share together maybe resonates with somebody that if you stay in this business long enough, you will go to an incident where your life may be suddenly on the line or that of somebody from the company that you're, you're with. And it's my hope that maybe you can just grab something out of this that will change the outcome, whether it's the onset of the incident, whether it's a course redirection midstream of the incident, that something will click with you to where we don't have to keep experiencing these same outcomes over and over and over a line of duty death. So with that, I, I thank you for, for the time that we shared.